they tell me that people have started to have weddings there and um, you know I get I get uh, that's the kind of engagement I try to uh, uh, look for you know in the public work if it can get kind of taken in like that and used and and that made me really happy to hear that stuff. This is the man behind the millipede. He's also the man behind the statue outside the Wichita Art Museum. Curious to know, what are you trying to say with that piece? I don't know if I can sum that one up, you know? Yeah, it's not as, it's, it's just, sometimes the work isn't as simple even to me. You know, and I think that's part of what art is. There's a deep ambiguity in it somewhere and I don't think it's as simple as as uh, just adding it up and if you could say it you wouldn't make it you know that you, you wouldn't have to make a thing um, sometimes it's a balance of dilemmas and opposites that makes it um, makes it art and makes it engaging the work should create a dilemma that that uh, forces people into a debate. While a lot of people here in Kansas are familiar with these pieces, Wichita native Tom Otternus has done so much more than that. Tom's art is seen by more New Yorkers than probably any other artist on the planet. Tom's art can be seen here at the 14th Street and 8th Avenue subway station. Any time of the day or night, if I feel bummed out, if I'm not, you know, if I feel depressed, I just take a subway detour over and get out, and somebody's looking at that all the time. To me, that's the real payoff, is to go sort of anonymously to these public works and see people interacting with them, have conversations, um, um, that's really a, the biggest payoff, more, more than this uh, wall for a, full of awards, I guess. <laughs> the wall that doesn't exist here. Tom specializes in artwork people can interact with, art that makes people think, art people can relate to. And it was really our ambition to get outside the art world, to get out of the museums and out of the galleries, onto the street. And into parks. While art galleries discourage you from touching the art, Tom encourages people to climb on it, touch it, feel it, however they want to interact with it. Yeah, one of the main things was to take the bronze work to take it off the pedestal, you know? Um, to talk a really simple language, that was important, to do this cartoon language that wasn't intimidating to people that didn't follow, that don't follow modern art. Um, Oh, I understand that. I know what that says. That's easy, you know? So to speak that language was important. Children like this boy have been enjoying Tom's art in Battery Park for years. In fact, this is known to most New Yorkers as Penny Park just because of the art, art that often incorporates pennies. And when you start working for a public, you start dealing with a subject matter that everybody understands or a kind of common subject matter, so it started fitting in then. This piece in Battery Park was his first big public sculpture, a piece that will always hold a special place in his heart. How, does, how did it feel at the time, because you're going to have to go back, because there have been many, many times since then, to look at a piece that you created and watch it be unveiled or watch people see it on such a large scale? What did that feel like? Yeah. Uh... We've got to watch for, you know, megalomania setting in, you know. <laughs> uh, I can take over the world now, you know. I mean, as you get elated by seeing it, I guess. I meet kids now that are in their 20s that grew up, you know, in that park. Um, so, you know, you know you're affecting generations, so that's a, that's a great feeling. While some of his art appears to have child-related themes, if you look a little deeper... There are political messages, there are just emotional messages, you know, and, that, and all of those layers uh, are okay. A lot, of, a lot of people will go... The humor is, is probably the first level, and, and it lets people come in and, and just, oh, that's funny, 
for a minute. And if that's it, that's okay. You know, if they, if that's all they get and they're gone, that's okay. Um, or you can get, you know, there are multiple meanings you can dig in for. Um, I always think it's surprising how much emotion you can get into just two eyes and a, and a line. How do you come up with your ideas? Dreams I don't remember or, um, um, or just, be, you know, the practical thing is that one, one, you know, I've built a world here and all these different parts talk to each other and I get ideas as I'm working on one thing, I get ideas for something else. Some of his pieces are small, while others, like this Gulliver figure, are almost as big as a house. This one can be found in the Netherlands. Tom loves creating art that allows people to walk around in it. This piece is titled Playground. Tom says as his art has evolved, it's also grown in size. My first plasters, we can look at them if you want. They're, they're, six inch figures that I cast in plaster and I sold for $4.99, you know, and bit by bit, you know, as I made an extra dollar, they'd get a little bigger and every time I make more money, they get bigger still, so. The biggest one so far has been 40 feet high out in Holland. If Tom's next goal comes to fruition, a future project will well surpass that. After 9-11, Tom designed a 40-story sculpture he hopes will become reality someday. This is his sketch of what it would look like. Glass and steel where you could walk around inside it. And I love that idea, you know, that, that uh, it could be sculpture that you would be in it and use it and walk around it, not just walk around it. As we told you earlier, Tom is a Wichita native. He attended Southeast High School back in the 70s and left Wichita when he turned 18. Yeah, I got a scholarship to the Art Students League uh, in New York. A place he's been ever since. This is his studio. It's located in Brooklyn, and as you can see, it's quite impressive. And I was a very shy kid. It's come, I've come a long way, I'll tell you. <laughs> Tom says getting to this point was a lot of trial and error. Sometimes it just takes a bit to find your way. He says the journey is actually part of the fun. I'm a big fan of evolution, and I think art evolves the same as we do, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very gradual. One thing leads to another. I, I think in the context of the modern art world, I stay very, con you know, very consistent. Well, I was first a painter, so I didn't, yeah, I, up until I was in my late 20s, I didn't really do sculpture. I did some little sculptures as a kid. I did a lion in the third grade, you know. Um, I went in a lot of different directions. A trip to Italy, where he learned about the bronze process, was what finally helped him decide what he wanted to do for a living. And that, then I, I thought, oh, this is the material for what I need for both the private market and doing public work, doing, seeing work in Italy that was four or 500 years old and, and still looks like it was done yesterday. I thought, okay, this is the stuff. This'll, this'll hold up. Did Wichita have any influence or does it still have somewhat of an influence on the way that you look at art? Oh, sure, I think so. I think that kind of, uh, dry Midwestern humor, <laughs> I think <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty Wichita. And Tom says the small town life definitely helped mold him. He says Wichita gave him the roots he needed to be a success in his field. The art schools there and my art training there was really important. The, the, the art association was a, a comp you know, unmatched kind of chance for somebody you could st we started at 12 and 13 to s study what would be college level um, um, painting courses and stuff like that. It wasn't just the formal training he received that sparked his interest, his creativity and his passion. He says that started a long time before. I got a lot of support from uh, my mom and my parents you know so that's that's always you know, if, if you've got a kid that you can encourage, that's, that's a big thing. Um, 
And it was sort of, no matter what uh, financial shape the family was in, if any of us, my sisters or I, wanted something, a music lesson or an art lesson or um, some material to work with, they found a way. You know, that was, it was a really an important thing. Although his parents aren't alive anymore, Tom says he still has ties here and Wichita will always be a part of him. I still go back. I go back and see my sisters and, and uh, uh, I've got lots of friends back there still. When I went back for the uh, opening of the Millipede at, at WSU, it was like a, what, a bar mitzvah, a homecoming, I don't know what it is, but, um, you know, my old high school teach art teachers, you know, Mr. Weddle was there and, you know, old friends from junior high and high school and even kids that, uh, kids that I'd played in the creek with at six and seven were there, you know, so it was, this is your, it was a this is your life moment, you know. But it made for a very, I never had an opening of a public work that was, um, anything like that, you know, it was, it was really a very special kind of day or two for me. A lasting tribute to this Southeast High kid, a permanent mark in his hometown. I mean, just to be invited in and given a place there, that's, that's a precious thing. A precious thing that Tom says he never takes for granted. At two in the morning, I'm like a little kid, you know, that's, I'm doing, I'm doing what I did when I was a kid and they're paying me, you know? So, <laughs> what's better than that?